going into your trading journey then, what were the resources that really kind of helped you and make money from this? Baby Pips was revolutionary. People uh, hate on it, it's a bit of a joke, you know, a bit of a kind of a meme, Baby Pips, whatever. The stuff that's on there is solid. The stuff I now trade and teach, you know, are candlestick patterns. Probably the two first patterns, candlestick patterns you learn, are exactly what I trade every single day across 15 assets. It's what I make all of my money on exclusively. What other characteristics do you see between the winners and, and the losers? That is the sort of million dollar question is what, what makes a good trader. If someone can be committed and disciplined in the small things, that tends to translate pretty well. The little things that you do have a massive effect. It's difficult to commit to something that you don't know if it's going to work. It's impossible to commit to something if you have no idea that it's going to work. Commitment, huge thing. And that commitment's easier if you have... Welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit of Profit pod. Today I'm joined by Samuel Kavanaugh. Thank you for coming. Pleasure to be here. All the way from Glasgow. Yeah. Delayed flight. Yeah, <laughs> a little now. bit, a little yeah. bit. Cool, well, thank you for coming down. I really appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of my audience probably know who you are. Um, you know, we spoke on the Gen Z panel the other and yeah. stuff like that. So if you just want to quickly introduce yourself for those who probably don't know you. Yeah, I'm Sam. I'm Scottish, so it's probably going to be difficult for a lot of people to understand me. But I've been involved in the markets since about 2015. Run a couple of trading floors, do some other interesting stuff, lecture at universities, conferences, that kind of thing. But all in all, just a pretty chill guy. Love it. Cool. Well, take us back anyway. I know you've been on other podcasts, you've spoken about your journey, but just to give us a bit of background of, you know, before trading and stuff like that, upbringing, if you yeah. want to take us right back. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's probably a similar story to what most, most people have. Didn't come from a super affluent background. Um, you know, grew up in a, a working class village, working class home. My dad grafting all day long um, as a builder to keep the home. Grew up in a very traditional environment, you know, very traditional. I'm going to have to use the term gender roles because that's that's the society we live in now. That's it, we're cancelled uh, yeah, now. No. <laughs> in podcast. I don't see you later, guys. Um, but grew up in that very traditional home environment, which mm. I'm exceptionally blessed with. So grew up in that. My dad having his own building company. Um, there was always that kind of, he always had a bit of an entrepreneurial kind of spirit to him. He had lots of ideas when he was younger, you know, he was very into motorbike racing and that kind of thing. And he had ideas for projects and things he would like to do that he never ended up being able to do. Um, so my kind of interest in business and stuff like that, I can't directly relate it to him. Um, and I wasn't super aware of it. I didn't study business in school or anything like that. But I do think it comes from his kind of his kind of mind. Him not working for anyone, him kind of running his own company, making the rules effectively. I like the idea of that. Um, through school, relatively normal schooling. Being a young guy, I was an absolute nightmare for all my teachers. It's only in the past couple of years I've begun to regret that immensely. You know, sometimes I think back to some of those teachers that you had and it's like, now knowing what I know now, they wanted the best for me and that kind of thing. But anyway, didn't really try very hard in school. Done all right in my exams, very into sciences and stuff. But outside of school, I was always into selling stuff, you know, um, had lots of things, you know, whether it be like toys or sports, bikes, whatever it may be. And I, from a very young age, I would sell stuff like that on eBay, bikes, whatever it was. Um, to make a little bit of money for other things I wanted to buy, whether it be like an Xbox or something like that. So um, I always kind of had that that mindset of if you need money for something, you go out and you know you, you sell something to get it. Um, but again, in school, no interest in business, nothing like that. When I was about 15, I came across Trading 2 on 2. It was a, on a YouTube advert, get a free $10,000 um, demo account. So I thought, great, done that. Didn't have any idea what I was doing. But it was something, you know, you're sitting with your mates at the lunch table and you're just, you're trading stocks, bro. <laughs> so, um, you know, people were like, oh, what are you doing there? And the fact people were interested in it made me 10 times more interested yeah. in it. That kind of stayed in the background for a while. Left school, went to college to study architecture and actually met Callum, who would become my business partner in KB many years later. But again, in the background, started our business um, manufacturing radio antennas sounds a little bit obscure but that's 
that's where things went. Developed a product for a very niche use. That went really, really well. How old were you at that point? 16, 16. 16 yeah. Got banned from PayPal um, in the process because you have to be over 18. They don't really care, you know, if you're just using PayPal to buy things, but when you start receiving thousands of pounds into your PayPal, you know, on a weekly or a monthly basis, it starts to raise eyebrows, they start to investigate. They weren't happy about it, shut the account down. That was a stress in and of itself. But in the background, still very interested in trading. Only really got serious into trading, although I was building this knowledge in the background, studying baby pips and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Got serious in 2018. By the time 2020 had rolled around, um, we had already had KB for about a year at that point, probably towards the end of 2019. Um, by the time 2020 rolled around, mid to late 2020, opened a trading floor, got people in, students and stuff like that that we taught through KB and grew from there. So that's that's a little bit of a whistle stop tour of, of the journey so far. Yeah, we were talking off camera before, there's so much that you've done as well. Yeah. You didn't even speak about it. <laughs> Honestly, I can't believe that you're, that you're 23, right? You've done so yeah. much. Um, but cool, so going into your trading journey then, when you first found it, when you were 15 years old, um, you were learning off baby pips and you know trading two on two and stuff like that. What was the point where it really started to click? You know, what were the resources that really kind of helped you mm. and you saw you can actually do something and, and make money from this? I mean, I'm not going to lie, baby pips was revolutionary. Um, people hate on it. It's a bit of a joke, you know, a bit of a kind of a meme in the in the trading space. Like, oh yeah, mate, baby pips, whatever. The stuff that's on there is solid. I mean, the stuff I'm now trade and teach, um, you know, are candlestick patterns. Now, of course, that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. There's all the statistical framework and, you know, all of the testing and stuff like that that goes into exploiting a, a statistical mechanical edge out of those patterns. But probably the two first patterns, candlestick patterns you learn, are exactly what I trade every single day, you know, across 15 assets. And it's what I make all of my money on exclusively. So, you know, you get three pages deep into baby pips, you're going to be looking at candlestick patterns. Little did I know, and it, of course, you know, my journey didn't go learn that and then profitability. It's like, you know, learn that, and it's almost like looping back to, yeah. you know, many years later, I really started to come into that. But Baby Pips was great. I would still recommend that to anyone. It's a little bit um, laborious to go through it all. You've got like 300 lessons or something like that. They might have added even more, but it's free, it's there, you can learn a lot. What you'll learn is a very broad sort of brush approach to the trading industry and it's about finding that sort of narrow niche within it that you're going to be able to exploit and make money. Um, also took a swing trading course from a guy in Israel very early on in my journey but really it was swing trading that attracted me because this idea of being able to get into a position and hold it and let it do the work, that was really where I wanted to go with it um, and so those were the kind of main resources that I used initially. I'd also picked up EFL from Tom Dante, Edges for Ledges. He'd done just like a, a live video series for his students back in like 2017. Released it to the public. There was, I ended up getting it for like 70 pounds or something like that. And that was revolutionary material for me. I still keep in touch regularly with Tom today. Um, you know, although I've kind of, departed into a, an avenue that he probably wouldn't really get on with and likewise I wouldn't really get on with the discretionary swing stuff that he he teaches or that he trades but if I could say one person you know or one resource that has benefited me the absolute most it'd be without a question Tom Dante's education okay. um, revolutionary stuff no no nonsense no conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff just purely down to the statistics, down to the testing, find an edge, prove the edge, trade the edge. Yeah, makes sense. So how did you develop Tom Dan on Tom, Tom Dante's teachings? Yeah. Because his is discretionary. I know you're very mechanical. Yeah. Zero discretion, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. How, how did that come about? And, and at what point did you decide when learning his system that actually you could better it or you, you could you know, refine the edge or you know, gain alpha elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I was trading the discretionary stuff and even within that, you know, the sort of foundational principles of how he enters the markets and that kind of thing. Um, I was applying them and I was even applying them to setups and approaches that he probably wouldn't himself. The thing that I found about discretionary trading was it was very stressful. 
very, very stressful. Um, through good periods, through bad periods, I didn't like this idea of coming in because look, what Tom will do, and he is very good at what he does, I, I think really to, to be able to make consistent money, you have to be very, very experienced in, in that kind of stuff. But he'll have a statistical framework for a bias pattern, you know, maybe a candlestick pattern or something. And then when he sees it in the charts, he'll say, no, I'm not going to trade that one or I am going to trade this one or, you know, that kind of thing. He'll make discretionary decisions there. And there was a bit of a disconnect there for me because I was saying to myself, well, if we have proof that this pattern works on every time it occurs over the last X number of years, you know, in your um, data sample, if you have proof that that works and it has a positive expectancy, why not just trade everyone? Because if you have a thousand occurrences of a pattern over, let's say, five years, you work out that over those a thousand occurrences, there's a 62% probability that it'll have a favourable um, outcome, whether that be a small profit or, you know, going straight to target. If you know that over those 1,000, if when it comes to testing or when it comes to live, sorry, you're implementing discretion and you're maybe cutting out half of those, right? You're now only taking 500. Now, we said we start with 1,000, 62% have a favourable result. That means 380 of them don't have a favourable result. If you're only picking 500 out of that sample to trade, what happens if you pick 380 of the ones that don't work, right? Mm. And then 120 of the ones that do. Yeah. So you've got a sample, these thousand, it would work, but you're only gonna trade some of them based on what you think. And it comes back to the trade what you see, not what you think. Mm. So when I look at the markets, I'm going, I don't think it's gonna work, but I'm gonna trade it anyway, because I've got the statistics here. Yeah. I found in my traders, and maybe we can speak about this a little bit later, of all the traders that have worked for me, the ones that have done the best are not academics. They're not guys who have been to university. The ones that have been to university, where are they? Yeah. They're, not, they're not here anymore. The guys who have done the best, Tim Bricklayer by trade, joined, came to work on the trading floor. I gave him a, I just said, we'll, we'll just go with you. He'd, he had a month's trading experience. I, I would, that's suicide, you would never take that personal. I took him on. He's now doing the best, you know, out of, out of everyone. And Grant, who was a joiner. So, um, but Grant, you know, the thing about people who work in a very practical job is everything is problem solving. You go to university, they teach you what to think, not, not how to think, right? Um, I don't want to be throwing out too many cliches here, sound like a, you know, your average business guru podcast yeah. but um we're already cancelled anyway so i know that. yeah no, no one's watching <laughs> yeah. at this point are they um so basically people come out of university they're taught they're taught what to think and they have a very narrow view of things and again i don't want to go on too many tangents here but to give you an example of it my dad before he was a joiner he was working in a chemical plant it started um in maintenance he had progressed to, you know, sort of overseeing operations and eventually became the manager of the, the plant. But when he took over that job of manager, um, he found, and the, the woman who was the manager before, he found in her office loads of reports that she'd done on the efficiency of the plant and that kind of thing. And he called in, you know, whoever the person was that was under him, and he presented all these findings. And he said, have you seen any of this? I said no and they were dated like two three years ago you know that type of thing so this woman she knew what to do see a problem you know go test it test for efficiency and all that yep put in a folder put it on the shelf and there was no a practical application it was just like yep tick that off I've, I've found that out now um and what I found it's, it's so you know it's it's not surprising but it's just such a it's not even a coincidence all the academic guys that came to work for me, guys who had studied finance at uni, guys who had studied law, law graduates, that kind of thing, they would do the exact same thing. They would build a statistical edge in a, um, a pattern and then they would trade the pattern that they tested, but they put the statistics to one side almost. They've, they've done all that testing and they'll trade the pattern, but they're not implementing any of the statistics. But the guys who came from bricklaying or joinery or whatever, very, very practical because that job 
you know, you're building a house, for example, there's a lot of problem solving in that. Mm. You might have the plans from the architect, you go, you start laying foundations, why is that pipe there? That pipe is not in the drawings. There's a lot of problem solving and having to think on your feet and stuff. And so those guys excel. Grant, um, <clears throat> you know, he's doing tests on Monday and he presents something to me, something similar to what we were just talking about. And he says, all of these work. They work without even putting in this criteria and that criteria and that criteria. And all of a sudden now we can go from something that was a very, very narrow set of rules. We can now make it much, much broader, take much more trades taking more trades not always the best thing but it's it's broader so there's more of a chance of it working long term in trading the more filters confluences conditions rules that your strategy has the less likely it is to work in most market conditions over the long term the broader it is the more likely it is to last the more likely it is to be robust so again speaking to grant and me and him really going through stats i was very hesitant at first but that really opened up my mind. And, you know, subsequently, we ended up actually bringing a course together, me and Grant together, and he took the lead on all the statistical stuff. And yeah, so that that's where the kind of idea to go mechanical was. But there was that kind of emotional element where there is the strain of, you're in a five hour drawdown. What is the probability of you getting back up out of that drawdown? You don't know. Um, because your statistics are for trading, this big sample and you're only trading maybe some of these so I wanted to have a bit more of a rigid foundation even though you know I was trading I'd been trading a while I was trading well I thought I need to have something that's a bit more concrete here people often say to me like when did it click and I'm like it's clicking every month yeah. every week it, things are still clicking for me I'm always when I hear like a trader on an interview or when I speak to a trader and I say to them you know, how are things or whatever, and they're like, yep, you know, I've got it, I'm there, I've arrived, you know, I've been here for two years or whatever. I'm always, I'm always sceptical of that because I think the thing that sets, you know, someone who's going to be here for the long term from someone who's just hit a niche where they're profitable in is that they are continually learning, they're continually adapting. It doesn't necessarily mean changing your approach, but they are continually learning and things are still clicking for me day, day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, and when they stop, I'll be worried. Yeah. You know, when I feel like I've arrived, I'll start getting concerned. Yeah. I think that's a really good point as well. I spoke to uh, Brent Donnelly on the podcast recently. Right. And he was talking about how every three to four years, his system changes, right? Right. Because he'll find an edge in one place. He'll find, you know, alpha here. And then eventually, you know, people clock onto it or whatever. It, it doesn't work. So you need to continuously be thinking about what's next. Where can I find that edge? And this is actually a question I wanted to ask you and get your perspective on. At what point do you decide that even though you've got X amount of back-tested data, you have an edge in the market over the last you know, X amount of period, um, and that, then you enter a period of drawdown, at what point is it just a period of drawdown? Yeah, great You question. know where the question's going. Or is it that there's no longer an edge here and I need to find something else? And I know it's how long is, it, how long is a piece of string and you know, these guys spend millions and millions every year yeah. to try and answer that question, but yeah. what's your perspective on it, even though there's no right answer? There is some phenomenal ways you can go into the data on this. So, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> one of the things that you can do, and you may not have thought of this before, you know, hopefully some of the people listening haven't thought of this before, you can plot a channel on your equity curve of your results. So, your equity curve, in an ideal world, it's trending up the way, okay? Mm. Now, if you have a decent enough sample, if you don't have a decent enough sample of live results, you could incorporate historical results, as long as those historical results are exactly the way you're trading it now. And this is a benefit to mechanical stuff. Build an equity curve over the past, I don't know, maybe eight years. Draw a channel on it, an ascending channel. You're and talking about doing TA on your equity curve? Once? Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You can add moving averages to your equity curve as well. Yeah. We can talk about this yeah. in a little bit if you want. But ascending channel on your equity curve, trend line on the bottom, trend line on the top add 10% to either side, right? 10% buffer. When your equity curve breaks down out of that ascending channel, stop trading. Because it's now out with, now, if your eight year sample size is like 50 trades, it's not gonna work. Mm. You need to have, you know, you probably want a thousand trades. You have a rough channel of how the equity curve should go. And then within that equity curve, you'll have periods where it's, you know, it's all over the place, it's coming, it's lost 50R or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. An ideal strategy hasn't, but, 
that should be broad enough that if the equity curve breaks down out of that, something has changed. The same with if the equity curve breaks up out of that. I'm not going to say stop trading it, but you need to start paying attention. Something's changed in the market. So you need to work out why is a strategy starting to operate out with its parameters. If your equity curve breaks up out of that ascending channel for an extended period of time, you know what they say, that the light burns brightest before it goes out. Something's changed, and just as quickly as it's done that, it could very easily come back down. Um, now, if it breaks down out of that channel, and let's say you have such a good strategy that that channel, if it breaks down out of that, you're maybe five R down. I'd maybe just less, lessen my risk for that. But ultimately, you're going to have a pain threshold, and you need to decide what that is, where you say, this strategy has made 80% over the past two years. I'm not willing to give back more than 20% of that. Now, if you go into a period of drawdown, the first thing you do before any of that, let's say you go into a three-month period of drawdown, go back to the start of that three-month period in testing, right? And test that period again, right? You've traded it live, now test mm. it. Maybe take a couple of weeks off to get fresh, test that period, and see how your testing stacks up against your live results. Oftentimes, you will find that your testing excels your live results. That could be for a multitude of reasons. One, you may, and note down, this is why you're journaling. Who was it I heard on a podcast recently saying, you know, you know, once, you're, once you've arrived, you don't need to journal anymore, or something like that. It's like, behold, the greatest trader of all time, you know. If you have a, a methodical journaling process, when you do this testing and there's a disparity between your tested results for that period and what you actually achieved in life, you can go through the journal and you can verify, oh, okay, it's because of swaps, spreads, whatever, or it's because it was a news event and I got slipped 4R or whatever, you know. Um, or you'll just be able to see, right, okay, I was asleep and I missed a stop trail or an early exit eight times. And that's why, you know, that's accounted for 8R lost or something like that. If your tested results and your live results stack up, that's when you would start to look into um, taking that strategy and testing it on a out of sample data. So a lot of people don't test correctly. What they'll do is they'll take the most recent, let's say three years, and they'll test an idea and they'll say, okay, you know, a strategy has 55% strike rate and it's made 100R over three years, fantastic. And then what they'll do is they'll apply some confluences, they'll apply some filters, they'll apply some um, rules and stuff like that to narrow the strategy down. And now all of a sudden they've got a 70% strike rate and it's made 200R. And they go, okay, I'm gonna trade this. Not so fast, you know, that's only part of the process. Once you've got that really refined strategy, the one that's now 70% strike rate, 200R, now take that three year sample, the strategy that you've applied, and pick another three year sample way back, maybe 2010 to 2013, and apply the strategy, the strategy that you've built, the really refined one, on that out of sample data, that 2010 to 2013. What you might find is the strategy doesn't work back then. That's a sign that you have curve fitted your strategy. You've taken a historical sample and you have refined it so much that you have fitted your strategy for recent market conditions and now it's not gonna work. Strip off those filters again and apply the base strategy to 2010 to 2013. Oftentimes you'll find it does work. Now it might not work great, it might be a 45% strike rate and it makes 80R, but that's still fine. So you would rather go for the strategy that makes less R over one sample, but continues to work. If it works on the out of sample, you have a robust strategy that should work in theory for a long, long time. Mm. Um, the markets aren't changing all that much, regardless of what people tell you. The markets really aren't changing all that much. Um, and if you have a system that has worked over that period, it, it should continue to work. You can also do things like applying a moving average to your equity curve. You can do things like that in Excel. Um, that's a very good indicator of when to up your risk. Um, if your equity curve drops below the moving average, you traded moving averages, right? Yeah. I used to trade moving averages as well. The market breaks above a 50 period moving average, you get a break of structure, you know, you get long, whatever. On your equity curve, if you're, um, what you'll find 
is that when your equity curve's under the moving average, when it breaks back above, it'll go parabolic for a little while. So what you can begin to do, and this is like really advanced stuff, you need a lot of data to do this and a lot of conviction to do this as well. You need to be prepared to eat the loss if it goes wrong. When your equity curve breaks back above that moving average, you can up your risk. You can actually start to get a bit more aggressive with um, your trade. When it dips below the moving average, you can start to lessen risk. Just on that quickly, if you're in a period of drawdown, extended mm -hmm. drawdown, mm -hmm. and the moving average is below your initial starting balance of, of your trading account, would you still advise to do that? Or no. surely it would always be when you're in profit, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Always when you're always when you're in profit, yeah. um, but realistically, if a strategy has come all the way back to break even, even after a historical sample of um, being profitable, you're already well out with that yeah. channel. Um, you should have stopped trading a long, long time ago. Yeah, you know. Okay. So, has that ever happened to you with any of the systems that you've traded? No, no. But here's how you protect against it. Mm -hmm. Always have multiple strategies. Always have multiple strategies. Um, you can't, you know, they say like the, you know, the richest people, the people who are wealthiest for the longest have multiple sources of income. That applies to trading as well. And I don't just mean like, you know, go out and start doing delivery or something like that. You know, if you want to do that, it's absolutely fine. Um, but have multiple strategies and be diversified. You know, I trade... I used to be a bit of a, a purist. I would only trade the majors because, I mean, even three, four years ago, spreads, commissions, that kind of thing on minors, on crosses and that kind of thing were horrendous. Um, even on some commodities, they, they were horrendous. But <clears throat> nowadays, brokers have gotten a lot, lot better. So you can trade something like euro pound and your costs aren't much more than trading euro dollar. I would always be diversified, you know, some majors, some minors, some crosses. Um, any combination of the top eight, you know, so that gives you about 28 FX you can choose from and, you know, gold and silver. So you're diversified in that sense. I swing trade mechanical. <clears throat> I have multiple strategies within that realm that I trade. Reversal strategies and continuations. What you'll often find as well, and sometimes I've talked about this on Twitter, I can isolate my... On my sort of equity curve, that's all of my stuff combined, you know, in my journal. But using Edgewonk, which is a journal and software I use, you can isolate strategies and see how they're performing. I have overlaid those strategies, and what you'll find is that when one's in drawdown, the other one's in profit, and vice versa. So they're actually like, the equity curves do this. That, again, is going to lessen your drawdowns and that kind of thing. And it means if one goes into an extended period of drawdown, technically the other one should be in a period of updraw. That may end up in you being break-even for a period. That's absolutely fine, that's the purpose. Um, but as well as that, be diversified in other products. So crypto, for example. I long-term um, hold crypto. So if trading goes through a two, three year bad period, you know, if crypto's doing well, I can be taking money out of crypto. Um, you know, if you're staking your cryptos as well, you can be earning money in crypto as well. So you are still trading, you know, you're still trading and investing, you're still deriving your income from that. But you're just diversified enough that if one thing stops working for a period, something else is going to pick up the slack. Yeah. So that would always be my approach. So your two systems, you said one's reversal, one's continuation. Yeah. What other differences? Is there any different in, you know, the kind of thought process behind the trade? No. In terms of TA or anything like that? No, I mean, they're both candlestick patterns. Yeah. One is indicative of a reversal in a market. One's indicative of a continuation. Um, and that's simple as is. There are the same time frames, daily time frame for the, the bias itself, hourly time frame for execution. You know, love I love the 60 minute time frame. It's very it's very useful because, you know, how many hours do you have in the day 24? You know, so if you're trading a five minute time frame, you're having to manage on the five minute time frame, all of a sudden you have a lot, you know, you have a lot of chart watching and that you're kind of thing. To the desk. And that's not why I got into trading, you know. Um, you know, you've got have to check the markets 12 times every hour, you know, times 24 um, on a five minute chart. No thanks. Um, I did do that for a while. I traded futures um, on the short term using um, Sierra charting, depth of market, footprint, reading the order flow and stuff like that. As soon as I mention order flow, the SMC guys are like, yeah. oh, I trade order flow. No, you don't. Um, but yeah, so trading the order flow, that was like, mind-blowing to me when mm. I discovered order flow trading but 
it was sapping up all my time and all my energy. And although I was really getting the hang of it and I felt I was pretty good at it, I thought, I, I can't, this isn't sustainable. Yeah. You know, I was trading. What was that like? Sorry to cut you, but obviously now you trade 15 instruments. Yeah. The way you trade now, I guess, is, is pretty different to just trading, what was it, German bonds you were trading? I traded, um, I did, I traded the, the Bund, which is a 10 year government German bond. And I also traded the DAX, which was a DAX 30 at that yeah. time. Um, or on futures it's FDAX and the FESX which is the Euro stocks 50. Um, so I would trade those two indexes and I'd trade German bonds. They tend to have a bit of an inverse correlation. Um, sometimes the indices lead and the, the bond lags and vice versa so you know sometimes some news would come out whether it be vaccine news we saw a little bit of that towards the end of the, um, the pandemic cancelled again <laughs> but yeah so that was really really interesting sometimes you would see the indices start to fly um, and then you could just get in short bonds before anything's happened just anticipating the move oh, I mean I, I love that stuff but like I say it was sapping the life out of me mm. big time and TA wise how different was it to you mentioned obviously order flow and market mm. depth and stuff like that yeah I mean so a lot of your sort of intraday plays would be just order flow based things but in terms of the the bigger picture i would still go through all the same technical analysis processes um in the german bonds the the bund is a market that really respects um levels very very well um you know again i was speaking to tom and he he that's what he trades in on the futures market so i decided i was going to trade that as well and I mean, it moves just wonderfully. As so does the Euro stocks. The DAX is a little bit more aggressive. You know, it's a bit of a thinner market. So when you look at the actual the actual order flow, when you look at the book, um, the DAX tends to be much thinner. You know, any one time you've got maybe like twenty contracts sitting on the bid or the offer. Um, you know, even through really um, busy market periods, the the stocks. You know, you're into the hundreds. So it's a much thicker market, and subsequently when the, the the DAX and the stocks move you know um, in tandem with one another very heavily correlated but when you know the DAX would be trading into a level the stocks would be trading into a level and the DAX would violate the level and come back up and the stocks would just drift into the level and touch it and move away so I, I started to like trading the stocks a little bit better and um, the euro stocks the problem that a lot of people have when it comes to if they wanted to go down that route is there's minimum sizing and stuff like that. The cost of trade can be pretty expensive on futures. Little nifty trick that you can do, you can pay for the futures data um, through a futures broker, you know, AMP futures or something like that. Plug that into Sierra. So you'll have all your order flow. It's coming directly from the exchange. You're seeing all the order flow real time, but you can trade these products on CFD. So you could have a broker, a MetaTrader broker open with let's say Admiral Markets or someone that offers those products. You could have that on this screen, depending on how many screens you have. Um, and then you could have your Sierra chart up there with all of the order flow and all that kind of stuff. And effectively, these markets follow the futures market. So even though they're CFDs, so you can trade the CFDs and just take all your order flow queues and stuff like that from the futures data. Yeah. And it's a very cheap, cheap way of trading it guys who worked at kb done exactly that you know they traded they tra executed on the cfd they took all their cues from the futures data because the cfds move you know almost identical a little bit of a disparity between the pricing you know the dax might be sitting at you know the bid on the dax might be i don't know one number and then on the cfd it might be 10 higher or 10 lower but it's moving the exact same yeah. you know so you would just you would see the level up there in the futures and you would just have to subtract 10 from it or whatever you know on the cfd but um so yeah that's the technical stuff was was pretty similar but throughout the day you'd have lots of interesting plays you know um it's it, it does become a little bit like a game of poker you know um the the futures because you're you're seeing all these numbers hitting the you know on the depth of market for example you can see all the limit bids you know resting you know on the, on the offer or on the bid um you can see all those limit orders there on the footprint that's showing you the orders that are actually executed directly into the market market orders that kind of thing but 
when you're looking at those limit bids and limit offers on the ladder, you are beginning, when you're really watching this, you're beginning to generate ideas in your mind about who is trading them and what they're trying to do. Um, so you can't see individual traders. You know, you may see sitting on the on the bid and let's say the boons, you might see 350 contracts, then below that is 280 and then below that's 320, whatever, all the way down. But what you might see happen is like an 800, maybe like five prices below market. And then the 800 is gone. And then you see 800 up there on the on the offer, you know, if you price above market and you start to think, that's one guy. He's he was sitting with eight hundred on the bid, few a few prices below market. He's now flipped. He's now wanting to get short, and then that disappears, and you're sitting there and you're going, right, okay. And then all of a sudden you see it reappear on the on the bid, and now you have a pretty good idea that that's one guy. You can start to generate thesis about what he's trying to do there. You know, you might see he might genuinely want to buy eight hundred contracts, but the market there isn't enough um, liquidity in the market to mark execute that. If he tries to hit that at market with 800 contracts long and there's only, you know, 200 on the on the offer, he's going to get slipped a few prices, right? Um, so he doesn't want to do that. So what he might do is he might start trying to encourage sellers. As so you can be looking at the TA and the market's coming up to a breakout point and he, he, want, he obviously wants to get long, he wants to buy this breakout. But what's everybody wanting to do at the breakout point? They're all wanting to buy. So he might actually come in and start pretty aggressively selling or he might you know flash on the offer that that 800 encourage sellers because people just like me they've seen it and they go there's a big boy he's wanting to get short and so what they do is they start trying to front run him they go he's got 800 contracts sitting five ticks above this breakout so as the market's trading up into that breakout they start selling and all of a sudden the offer is starting to pack out you know the the sell side of the book it's starting to pack out and there's now a lot of, and then all of a sudden that 800 disappears mm. and he market executes 800. And when that disappears, the sellers freak out, you know what I mean? Or the, the buyers freak out rather and it just, everything goes mental. And then people start piling in behind him, buying, 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 and you see the market fly up. Yeah. And you're seeing this happen real time and it's like, it's mind blown. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You're, yeah. you're seeing what's behind the candles. Um, and there's a novelty aspect to that, you know, as well. You you think, well, if I can see what's going on behind the candles, I can make unlimited money. Uh, just not quite like that. Yeah. But it was it was fun. It was very enjoyable. And you would get those little, if you're watching it and you've been watching it all day, things start to click. But I don't want to sit and watch the markets all day. Yeah. And those European markets, the Eurex exchange opens 7 a.m. So you have to be in quarter past six. Um, and that means... Being in the office 6.15, it means leaving the office probably 6 p.m., 12-hour shifts in the office, going to the gym, getting home, getting something to eat, getting a wash straight to bed, you know. Yeah. Up early as well. Yeah. yeah. And the guys who are successful in futures, that's their life. Yeah. You know, they're never not in the office. And they'll get up through the night to check Asian markets and all that kind of stuff um, to see what's going on. It's... It's a crazy lifestyle, and it's not for me. Yeah, no, I you get know. you. A lot of that happens in crypto, right? Because liquidity is a lot thinner. People spoof orders, and like you yeah. say, people try and front run, but really they just want to they get the, along. The thing with um, crypto is, in the UK, it's not illegal to spoof the market. Spoofing's not an illegal practice in the, in the UK. It is in the US. That's illegal to do that in the US. Um, so if you're trading US markets, you can get in trouble. Mm -hmm. You can actually get in trouble for for spoofing if you're trading US markets. And we saw that happen to, I don't know if you heard the story of the flash crash trader, um, Nav Sarab. the book, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, guy yeah. in his mum's bedroom. It was a good in book. West London, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hounslow. Um, yeah, I think Tom worked beside him, actually, at, at Futex. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. Um, but he was spoofing the markets, which isn't illegal here, but he was trading the e-mini. The e he was trading the US market, so... Um, they extradited him, didn't they? Um, but in crypto, there's very limited regulation, so you could do whatever you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, crypto, I don't know, I don't think I'll ever get into trading, trading crypto, um, unless FX begins to begins to thin out and die down. I think with the way AI and stuff like that's going, don't know what your take on this is, but I think that could be a possibility. Yeah. Um, you know, 10 years' time, if a lot of these banks, you know, if they're 
using AI and they're using algorithms and that kind of thing, um, it could cut out our little slice that we get with the markets. And in that eventuality, I'd probably move over to crypto because yeah. that'd still be relatively retail dominated. It's less efficient, right? It's easier to, to gain an edge, especially in a bull market. It was like buy yeah. support and yeah. <laughs> you yeah. just made money. Um, okay, cool. So your system now, obviously you've uh, you know, taught a lot of traders, you've got you know, trading flaws that you had. Is there anything you're doing to your system now? Maybe you don't want to say on camera, but is there anything you're testing to try and improve? If you want to say, if you don't, we can <laughs> move on from here, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not too fussed ab about t telling people what I'm doing because, you know, I, let's say I say this, I, let's say I give my whole strategy here you know, 10,000 people hear it. Of that, you'll maybe get 20 or 30%, I'll say, you know what, it'll probably be 20%. Now that I've said that, you maybe get 30 or 40% and I'll go, okay, I'm definitely gonna try yeah. this. Of that 20 or 30%, you're gonna get about half of those that'll actually commit to really testing it and that kind of thing. And of them, maybe half will actually put it into practice. And of them, maybe half again, I'll, I'll stick stick with it through periods of drawdown so it doesn't phase me you know there's no closely guarded secrets um at the end of the day i could give away all of my material for free and it i don't think it'd affect my edge at all yeah. because people do not have the discipline to to just apply it um, and to trust it but one of the things i'm testing at the moment i happened upon uh, a great metric that people should be tracking if they don't already track is maximum adverse excursion. How far in percentage does your trade go against you um, before it turns into a winner? Now, if you track that over all of your data and you find that, for example, on average, your winning trades go 30% against you, what you can do is you can say, well, what would happen if I halved my stops? And you can do this without even going back to the charts. You can do it in the, your spreadsheet. So the way you would do that is any column or any row where you've tracked a 50% MAE, that is now a full one hour loss, right? Because the trades went 50% against you, your stop would be halved, it's now a full one hour loss. Filter out your spreadsheet, every 50% MAE, change it to negative one hour. Anything below 50% MAE, I mean, and it's the same with anything above is, is now a full one hour loss. Anything below, so 49% and below, double whatever you made on the trade. That's what would happen if you if you have to stop, um, because your risk reward is doubled, right? So you can very quickly go through. You know, it took me about forty minutes. Go through my spreadsheet, and I can go. Okay, so without management, I would be making. You know, over the sample size, I've made three hundred R more, and with management, I've made one hundred and eighty R more. So I'm straight away thinking, well, my stops. I'm not just going to go in and half my stops. I still have technical principles that I need to apply. But I'm now exploring, is there room to be more aggressive in my stops? Um, there's a potential I'm being just a, a tad too conservative. That's not always a bad thing. It's going to reduce your drawdown periods and stuff like that if you're getting less one hour losses. But ultimately, if I can prove from testing over a decent sample size that reducing my stop losses by up to 50% is not going to impact my maximum drawdowns too much um, outside of my sort of pain threshold, I'll be looking to, to tighten those stops and be a bit more aggressive. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm, I'm looking to apply now, okay. um, or at least explore yeah. at the moment. That's interesting. I had um, Charlie Burton on the podcast recently, and I spoke about you know trailing stops or leaving yeah. you know your stop at your invalidation level to to run. And he said that um, his take on it is he leaves everything to run because from his testing, he'll make more from that. And if you trail your stops, all it does really is just reduce your drawdown. But if you leave your trades, they'll, they'll make more. Is that why you trail your stops? Is just to reduce the drawdown and kind of get a slightly smoother equity equity curve? Because if, if you left them, it'd yeah. probably just be more up to the right. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I would say to people is, I think trade management is is an excellent um, is an excellent practice. Um, it does, it reduces drawdowns and that kind of thing. But if you test a strategy and it doesn't work without trade management, don't trade that strategy. Because then trade management is the strategy in and of itself, yeah. not this bias. So you have a bias, you know, let's say a bullish engulfing on the daily, for example, and you test it, and with no management, it, it's negative. And with management, it's 50 or up. 
that means that the pattern doesn't work. It means your management makes money, but the overall thesis for the trade doesn't make sense. It's yeah. not a profitable thesis. So all of my systems, no management makes money. In a lot of cases, it makes more money um, than than managing the trade. And that's more my, my point is, because it makes more money, would you not rather do that? No, and this is where it comes down to the equity curve. Um, now, if you're just trading your own personal funds, crack on. You know, if you if you find a strategy that's no management, one of my guys, Tim, his strategy is no management. It's the most simple strategy. He trades on 20, 31 assets, um, because why not? Um, you know, if if it works, if it works on fifteen, it, sh- it should work on more. Yeah. Um, but he trades it on thirty one assets, twenty eight FX oil, gold, silver, um, and he trades it with no management. The drawdown periods are horrendous and they're frequent. If again, I've put stuff um, out on social media about this recently. My performance without management since the start of twenty twenty two is very similar to what it is now. You know, in terms of R, but the equity curve is like this. Yeah. And what I'm doing is I am ultimately, I'm very conscious of building my portfolio of results. I want to have something that I can present to people. You know, I'd get private investors and stuff like that contact me, very interested, who, who would want funds to be managed. And yeah, I, I want an equity curve that, that looks nice. Um, mm. And there is a practical element to that as well. It's, it's going to be much easier to execute your edge if you're not, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. You make, you have a 30 hour run in no management and then you have a 30 hour drawdown, you know, straight after you've just undone everything you've just done. I would much rather be 10 hour up, you know, than 30 hour up, 30 hour down. Yeah. The other thing we need to look at is if that's how you make money, ultimately you need something that's going to be nice and consistent. Even if you've got savings and stuff like that, even if you've got investments, you've got a decent amount of cash in the bank, really we want to be seeing over each quarter that we're we're making money and that we're nice and consistent. Peace of mind. Um, you know, I'm I'm at that stage in my life and I'm only twenty three, but you know, I've got I've got a wife, we're, you know, planning um I can't announce a pregnancy here, can I? <laughs> Done. Um, when's this gonna get released? I don't know, probably like five weeks. Ah, that's fine. Um, I will have announced it by then anyway, but we've got a baby on the way, you know. Yeah, thanks, man. So it here first and release it next week. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just a real, just a yeah. sound bite of it. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a young guy, but I'm a family man at heart. And, you that's know, amazing, man. I, I, I don't want to be, I'm, I'm already at that stage where I want things to be nice and, and comfortable. I want things to be predictable. Um, and I, I want that that element of security as well, and that goes for anyone really. You know, you want to know that what you're doing is secure. And these big P and L swings, it doesn't fill you with a lot of confidence, and it does mean that for extended periods of the year, as my no management um, results would would indicate, you will be down for significant periods of the year, and then you have a two week period where you recover it and more. It's, it's too inconsistent for me. Um, now, that's not to say that you couldn't have like a B account where you just set up another account, you know, you just let it do its thing and you just put on the trades and you just set and forget type of thing. Fantastic, you know, you could do that. Um, but at the moment, I've got so many accounts that I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on that I just, maybe it's something I'll implement it at, at some point. But for now, um, management is you know, it's a key part of my, my trading. Gives you peace of mind, doesn't it? Yeah. But yeah, a, a Ross stops to break even, to give it breathing room, but also, like, like you say, reduce periods of... of it drawdown. depends when you move stops to break even. I mean, that's a, that's a significant factor. Um, if you're... Um, I'll qualify that. If you trade a break and retest of structure and one of your rules is that it has to be the first touch of structure, you know, the second, third, fourth touch is invalid, fine if the market makes a new structure and you move that stop to break even you don't expect the market to come back there if it has your stats dictate that it shouldn't tap the level twice fine um but just moving stops to break even like a lot of people do i think it's just i think it's dumb you know and um, personally i'm of the i'm of the belief that you know and again there's something that tom ingrained in me pretty early on was we often we move stops to break even and we say we have a free trade now. 
if you're up 3% and you move your stop to break even, you don't have a free trade. If that comes back to break even, that's not a free trade, you just lost 3%. So I don't look at my balance, I look at my equity. If you're up 15% in floating trades and by the end of it, you realize a four or 5% gain, you've lost 10% there, you know, 10 or 11% in my books because you had that profit and you've let it go. Um, so sometimes we have that mentality of stops break even, free trade, can do whatever it wants. It's personally not the way I look at it. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way. It's personally not the way I look at it. I also think that it can be a bit arbitrary. You know, you're effectively saying if the market comes back to this point, the trade no longer works. My question to that trader would be, is there any kind of statistics behind that to say the market shouldn't tap this level twice or three times or four times or six times? I find, you know, I'm in a trade at the minute on, on silver and, you know, it's been back to entry three or four times i'm just checking i mean it's been back to entry a number of times and if i was someone who moved stops to break even i'd be out of that trade um and that's something i see happen very very frequently markets chop around you know the the best way i can give a, a trade room to breathe is not touching the stop until it's had a significant break of structure in which case i would trail that stop into profit and you know um get some profit locked in effectively. How do you trail your stops then? A, a solid, clean break of structure. I would move it up to the candle that breaks that structure. What time frame do you normally look at? H1. Okay, one hour. So, yeah. So, um, that does mean, you know, you can have a trade that's running significantly in profit and it can, you know, it's not, but it's not giving you a clean break of structure. That does happen from time to time. And, you know, then you're effectively sitting, you've, you've lost profit there. That's where you would track maximum favorable excursion as well of your trades. How far in percentage do they go into profit before you end up getting the exit, whether it be a stop or a trailed stop or whatever. Um, and if you find that your maximum favorable excursion, your average is let's say 65%. Something else you can track is the planned R at the beginning of every trade. So if over your sample size you've planned a thousand R, so that's just whatever your planned risk reward was. You've planned a thousand R, your average maximum favorable excursion is 65%. That means you have 650 R effectively at one point, you know, um, if cumulatively across the trades. You find that you've only realized 200 of that. You maybe need to start looking at smaller targets, would be the first thing I would look at. Um, if trades are consistently running 65% target and then returning, well, your target's you know 35% too far away effectively. Drop it back to that 65, retest the sample. You might find that you're capturing a lot more of those profits. If that doesn't work, it would be a case of implementing a different management approach. You okay. know, So trade comes with an X percent of your target in one move, you, you exit the trade, whatever it may be. But MFE and MAE are the most abused metrics that you know just could transform a lot of people's trading. Yeah. Definitely. And targets wise, touching on that, how do you identify your targets? It's it's usually swings, daily swings. Um, I'm not a trend trader. I'm not looking for trend moves. Um, I did, you know, as a swing trader, coming from a swing trading kind of um, origin, that was what you're always looking for. You know, you'd put a fib on an impulse move and, you know, you'd get in on the correction and you'd be looking for like a fib extension or something like that. Fantastic. You know, trade that next impulse leg. With the way I trade, I'm saying, you know, if you're in an uptrend, when's an uptrend become invalidated? Well, it's when price closes below the most recent higher low. When's a downtrend become invalidated? When price closes above the most recent lower high. So what we have when we're looking at a trend is you effectively have two swing points, one to the upside, one to the downside, and that's going to dictate whether the trend is valid whether the trend's going to continue rather or whether the trend's not going to continue, what happens at those swing points. So those swing points are key stitch up areas. So when the market gets there, you can have a lot of interest from traders who are trading the, expecting the trend to fail or trading expecting the continuation. I don't want to be involved in that noise. So I'll get out when it gets to that swing point. And if it goes from there and provides me another opportunity later on, fine. But I'm looking to take it to those points in the market where the a decision has got to be made about whether the trend's going to continue or not. Typically, if you find a market trading in between two swing points, you know, you know it's going to hit one of those swing points. 
You know, you don't know if it's going to go past, and that's ultimately where looking at the probabilities. I want to lean on the side of probabilities. Yeah, got you know, you. always. Cool. So I want to shift the conversation a bit to the niche, the trading niche, the, the retail trading niche itself. We've spoken a lot about your systems and mm. your journey and, and and things like that. Um, the first point. For people watching this, you know, aspiring traders, you've worked with a lot of traders and managed traders on floors. Earlier, you spoke about, you know, traders that went to uni, traders that didn't yeah. go to uni. What other characteristics do you see between the winners and, and the losers? Yeah, I mean, oh, that's, a, that's a big question. It's, that is this sort of million dollar question is what, what makes a good trader. Um, commitment is a huge thing, you know. Commitment is a huge thing. If you can... If someone can be committed and disciplined in the small things, um, that tends to translate pretty well. In fields like trading or in fields like professional sports or things like that, the, the little things that you do have like a massive effect. You know, you imagine like you, you drop like a stone into water, whatever the ripples, you know, they're, they're getting bigger and bigger each time, right? Um, that's I see it happen, and again, I know it sounds like such a cliche, but I, this uh, this is what I've observed. All the little things like being there on time, and if they're you know um, keeping on top of their sleep and their fitness and all that kind of stuff, it has a massive effect, you know, on their trading overall. But if they can be consistent and disciplined in small things, it tends to translate pretty well. Tim, who I spoke about earlier when he first came to KB, he had lied on his application, said he had trading experience he didn't have. That came out at his interview, you know, and I started asking him trading questions and he was like, uh, I don't know. It's like, yeah, mate, what price is uh, cable sitting at? And he's like, uh, 1.8. <laughs> no, wait. Um, so when he came up, he had a bit of savings behind him. He came up from England and he ended up having to work night shifts and all that kind of stuff just to afford to sustain his life whilst he was learning to trade. But his commitment in that aspect, where he was willing to do what it takes, that translated well into profitable trading results. The other thing that I've noticed is people who have something to fall back on don't tend to excel either. If you've got a degree to fall back on, you're going to fall back on that degree. I know a guy, won't name him, um, who he had a degree in finance and you know here we are three years later he doesn't trade now he's going to go back to uni and he's going to continue on his on with his degree that tends to be the the way of people and so when you hear successful people and they all have these like really impressive stories and it's like that tends to be the the common denominator is they didn't have a lot and so they didn't have really anything to fall back on they had to go out and earn it and get it for themselves another guy i know you know, came from a, a very, very wealthy background. So he's always got mum and dad to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last I heard, he's not he's not doing so hot in, in the markets. Because you've got something to fall back on, you've got that financial support and stuff like that from people in your life. If you don't have that, you, you need to go out and, and get it and you'll do anything it takes to make it work. Um, but commitment in the small things, big thing. People who come in late, people who don't come in on some days, you know, or... They have this attitude of, again, like they've arrived, well, I've done all my testing. There's always something to be tested. There's always something to do. Even just sitting, looking at the markets for weeks on end, you learn things, you 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 know generate ideas and that kind of thing. So commitment, huge thing. Um, and that commitment's easier if you have a statistical framework. It's, it's difficult to commit to something that you don't know if it's going to work. It's impossible to commit to something if you have no idea that it's going to work. When you're in between, let's say, 60 and 100% positive that it's going to work, it's much easier to commit to to actually doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know if you get this a lot, but I get a lot of people reach out to me and ask me, how do you stay motivated? You know, how do you yeah. How do you find the time? Yeah. It's like, well, I just wanted it so badly, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like, if you don't want it, you're not going to put the time in. So, like you said, commitment and also... If you've got something to fall back on, naturally you're not going to want it as much. But when you, what is it, burning the ships, I think is the, um, yeah. yeah, you burn the boats, you, the, there's no way to go back, right? You've yeah. only got one option, which is which yeah. is this. Yeah, and that's, you know, I would never advise someone to go and burn boats. You mm. know, I'd never advise people to be like, 
if you burn all your bridges, you'll definitely make it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, not so fast. But that is, you know, and people people do ask stuff like that all the time, don't they? You know, how do you stay motivated and all that kind of. A lot of the time, someone will contact me about getting into trading, and I'll ask them a couple of questions, and then I'll say, "In all honesty, mate, like I know trading seems like something you'd like to do, but if I were you, I'd just." take it up as a bit of a hobby, just kind of learn about the markets and see where you go from there. I wouldn't be committing your all to it just now because I don't know if it's for you. And, you know, I think nine times out of 10, they they end up not actually going through with it or sticking to it long term. And I'm sure they, they appreciated that advice early on. Um, there are some people where, you know, they speak to you and you think, you, you know what's up. If someone asks you how long it's going to take, straight away I'm like, mate, just... Just put it on the back burner, learn a little bit about it, and you know, in three, four years, let's let's see where things are. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think you need to be very process driven as well, right? And not just focus on the outcome. Like the people who are asking how long it takes, they're yeah. just looking at the end rather than actually understanding the process, falling in love with the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, trading's trading's quite unique in the sense of, you know, you go and work for you know JP or something like that and you're doing an analyst job or you know you're doing an administrative job the more hours you put in the harder you work the more potential there is to ascend up the career ladder and that kind of thing trading's not really like that um you can put in a lot of work you can spend a year testing and refining a system and then you know end up not working or something change in the markets or whatever if you're not in love with the process you're not going to stick it out if your obsession is with getting a a rigid outcome um, and that's something you require, going in a more traditional route of life, you know, going in and doing a job that requires a degree and stuff like that, it's probably better for you. And I think there's any shame in that. You know, we see a lot in our day and age, you know, in their kind of hustle culture, people kind of dismissing people who want to go and work a nine to five and stuff like that and people who want to go the traditional route I think if that's what suits you then great you know more, yeah. more power to you it's not every not everybody's going to be a trader not everybody has to be a trader um the person you know working at a petrol station or the person you know working on a trading floor at JP all of these people have a part to play in society and they're all equally valuable roles you know obviously some have more of an impact than others but um Whatever you do, whatever field you're in, just excel at that. That's that's what I say to people. We have this kind of, you know, the lavish lifestyle, all that kind of stuff glamorized. I think whatever you do, there's absolutely no shame in it. If you work honestly and you excel at what you do, I think you're you're more valuable than the person who's earning ten times as much but is slacking off and is, you know, earning at this you know, um, with dishonesty and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I com completely agree. W what are your thoughts on full-time trading as well? Because a lot of people, within their first three months, yeah. know, they want to quit their job and, and go full-time. What what advice would you give, you know, a buffer before they quit? You know, a lot of people, they get funded and before their first payout, they, they quit their job and go full-time and they end up inevitably yeah. blowing the account. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like that, um, that meme with... Jonah Hill, isn't it, where he's like, you know, he goes and he quits his job, I think yeah. it's from Wolf Wall Street or something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, again, that's that kind of mentality of, you know, I've made it, I don't need you mm. anymore. If if you if someone feels ready to, to commit to trading full time and they've got a bit of savings there and they've got the support of family, wife, girlfriend, whatever, fine. Something I would always say to people, and again, this is going to make me unpopular because it doesn't sound cool. You know, it sounds cool to be like, no matter what anybody says to you, you just, you know, you do you and prove, you know, whatever. Ultimately, the people around you are more important than the markets. Um, if you have to burn bridges to pursue a career in the markets with family, I'm not talking about like your mate who's jealous of you or your mate who thinks mm -hmm. you're an idiot or whatever. If you have to burn bridges or it's causing serious tension in serious relationships, don't do it. It's not worth the hassle. You know, I'd much rather have my wife and family on side um, than be making a little bit more and have no friends or family around you. Just on you that know. though, just to interrupt, do you think 
maybe you were blessed that you had supportive parents and a supportive girlfriend because I, I definitely was. Yeah. And when I look at some of my friends and you know their family say, no, you have to go to uni, you have to go down this path. You know, what, what would you say to, yes. to those people? So I, I wouldn't say, let me um, sort of clarify that. I wouldn't say let people dictate the path of your life. Certainly mm-hmm. not. Um, but I mean, like, if you're dependent upon these people. So let's say you're a guy and you're, you're you know, 17 and you're living at home with your folks. And you ultimately, you got to honour them first, you know, again, coming from a Christian kind of worldview, honouring your, your mum and dad is, is a huge thing. Um, and find a compromise with them. You say, look, I want to be a trader. They say, we want you to go to uni. You say, okay, well, I'll go to uni. I'll learn to trade. And if I can prove profitability, if I can prove that there's a career here for me, then go and do that. You know, you can easily learn to trade and to trade around a full-time job or around university. It's not one or the other. No matter what anybody tells you, you can do both. Um, you know, so do both. And then once you're old enough, you're no longer dependent upon these people, you're in your 20s, you're earning enough money, you can then, of course, you can you can depart from that. But, um, you know, from that, that university or whatever it is, that career path they kind of wanted you to go down. But when you're at, that was more advice for younger people, you know, Again, because they're the people that are getting all this sort of hustle culture stuff of like, you know, regardless of what anybody says to you and stuff. Ultimately, you're living with your folks. They're putting food on the table for you. They're paying for the roof over your head. They're paying, you know, you got to keep them on side um, because those relationships are absolutely invaluable. I certainly, you know, I did have supportive parents to an extent. They didn't really want me to trade Um you know, they felt it might be gambling. My dad, I remember him saying to me, like, it doesn't really contribute anything to society, though. It's not like building a house or, you know, anything like that. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um, but, you know, I went and I proved it and I was able to, you know, and I, at some point, you're your own man um, or woman, as the case may be, and you're no longer living with your folks and stuff like that. And they're, they kind of back off a little bit anyway. If you're in your 20s and you're living on your own and your parents are telling you what to do, you know, something's gone wrong at yeah. some point. Um, but certainly, you know, keep keep those people on side um, and go full-time when you feel you're ready to go full-time, providing that it's done with wisdom. you got to have savings, you know, um, in the bank, especially if you're now at the stage where you've got a family, you've got a wife that's dependent on you, you've got kids, you know, that kind of thing. You can't afford to be taking unnecessary risks. And so the risks that you take, you have more room for error before you're like 30, you know, before, once you crest that hill, your room for error, you know, it becomes a lot narrower and you have to be a bit more conservative. When you're young, you you know, again, let's say you're living with parents, get a job, you know, on the side, maybe you're at uni, get a job on the side, save up money, learn how to trade, implement you know some of your own cash um actually start trading that try funded challenges that kind of thing and you again you have room for error there you're still young you burn through all your money you sh- really shouldn't but let's say worst comes to worst you've done that um you can always fall back you yeah. know on that um you have a lot of room to play with there again as you've got people depending on you and stuff like that your your room for error drops and you need to have a bigger buffer. You want to have a year's um, savings there and that kind of thing. You uh, But you also, what you definitely want to have if you're going full-time is proof that your system works. Yeah. And this is where I think a statistical edge is paramount. Yeah. I think what you said about, you know, as you get older, you can take, you can't take as much risk yeah. and take the risk when, when you're younger. I think that's, that's spot on. And that was kind of highlighted in crypto in 2021, right? These guys right. who had Families were just going all in, but really your risk appetite as you get older, like you say, should yeah. drop when you're younger. You shouldn't lose all your money, but if you do, it's not the end of the world, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, you've got plenty of time to bounce back. Um, and that that applies pretty much across the board, you know. Um, you Still, all risks should be calculated. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be doing stupid stuff. Um, all on black. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what so, advice would you give to absolute beginners? They're three months into their journey main things to kind of look out for. There's a lot of bad information online. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe talking to your yourself, you know, when you were three months in, what, what advice would you give? The playing field changed. You know, when you and I got into trading, what were the big pitfalls? 
signals groups, you know, getting signed up through something. Firms weren't a thing. Yeah. Binary options. Yeah. Binary <laughs> options were a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> but when you and I got into trading, it was put three hundred pound into this brokerage account and follow my signals. Yeah. And that exists, but not in that form. It now exists, you know, by the prop firm challenge. Mm. It's exa- I don't care what anyone tells me. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. Because it's it was put £300 in an account, follow my signals, I'll make you rich. Now it's pay £300 for a challenge, pass the challenge, you'll be rich. And the likelihood of success, because it's trading, is the exact same. It's just as low. So now a lot of people get into the markets, they're buying prop from challenges left, right and centre, trying to get lucky. I know a lot of people who have done that. Um, so I would say to people, don't go chasing you know, a prop from account or anything like that. What to do is take advantage of free education that's out there. There's plenty of education for that I think is, it's maybe not ideal, but it's free. So if you've not got any money, you know, you could look at something like baby pips. Cool, I wanna go into crypto a little bit. Um, I know you hold crypto, you mentioned you don't trade crypto, uh, but you, we spoke off camera about your kind of framework over the next two or three years. Do you wanna kind of? Yeah, so I did trade crypto, um, but that was more exploiting a, a broker and efficiency on cracking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier about um, someone who you'd spoken about who trades edges and then, you know, every few years, once the edges has evaporated, he moves on. Um, so I had an edge like that in, on cracking. So cracking, I've seen a lot of people complain about cracking on Twitter on their, I don't know if it was all of their data or just USDC pairings where the market would be trading along and then all of a sudden it would spike, you know, up or down two, three percent. And people were getting liquidated on, you know, trades. And I thought, wow, I'm never going to touch that, you know, that, that broker, that looks terrible. And then I saw a guy post a chart on Kraken and it was a USDC GBP feed. Um, so it's, you know, pretty much the opposite of cable, dollar against the pound. And he had all these fill orders above and below market, you know, on these wax. And I thought, he's trading the spikes. Why would he share that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I put five grand in a cracking account. I think it started with a grand maybe, but uh, I put a load of money into a, crack an account, you know, incrementally start building it up. And what I would do was I tested different Bollinger Bands just as a, to give me a sort of a cue of how far things were going, how far it was spiking. We're looking at it on a two hour chart and I adjusted the Bollinger Bands to the point where the lower band often caught most of the wicks. And so what I would do was unleveraged, you know, full account because it's spot limit bid below market <clears throat> on this bottom Bollinger Band and just <coughs> forget about it. Check back the next day, nothing's happened. Check back the next day, that order's been filled and the market's back where it should be and you've made 2%. Um, and so I just rinse and repeat and done that for a little while. And then I think they just, they corrected the the error in their, their data. Um, their sort of pricing algorithm, whatever it is. No, it's just it's just the their pricing feed. They they fixed the discrepancy in it, yeah. but there was an inefficiency there, and I exploited it for a while, and then they sealed it up. That was the only trading I done in crypto, but everything else is just long term holds. You know, mm-hmm. I hold, I sold all my Bitcoin. Oh. Wow. Um, now that's not because I don't believe in Bitcoin, but it's because the the profit potential that those funds can be allocated over, you know, that we're in Bitcoin, you know, let's say Bitcoin does a 2x, you know, from where it is. Okay, so you've doubled your money, great. That, those funds could be allocated over five other projects and multiple of them could do a 2x easily from where they are, you know, lower cap altcoins and stuff like that. So I thought, even if only one of these does a a 5x, it's actually more than, I would make in, in Bitcoin. So I think I think Bitcoin's here to stay in all honesty. Just on that quickly, do you look at alt BTC charts at all? Um, to look at like Bitcoin dominance and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. From, yeah. from time to time. 
Um, but mostly I'm just looking at it against, you know, Tether or something like that. So got rid of my Bitcoin. Um, I, I have a pretty big bag of Ethereum, but my average price on that's not so great because I was, I was averaging up and averaging down on it. I think Ethereum's got, you know, a decent amount of utility. I think it's going to be a long term. Um, it's going to be a, a long term um, pick. You know, I think it's going to be here for a long time. So I hold quite a big bag of that, and I'm not too fussed about my average price. Ripple. Again, it was one of those hopeless plays where the SEC announced their lawsuit and stuff like that, and I thought this is dirt cheap. I got in around twenty cents, um, and then. Luna Classic, when that collapsed, you know, I hold millions. I think I, I think I hold like 14 million Luna Classic or something like that. Um, I remember on the way down, KSI paid something ridiculous, like 100 grand for 270,000 um, Luna Classic. And I hold 13 and a half million, you know, and it cost me buttons compared to that. So I like those plays that just seem hopeless, you know, where you think, there is no way this is going to recover and everybody's like running for the hills. Um, that's, I like those plays, allocate a little bit of funds to them. But other than that, Polygon Matic, UTK, um, Elrond, those types of things, B Chain, Polkadot, you know, all the kind so of. So you've got quite a diversified. Yeah, portfolio. I, I probably got about 25 oh, wow. different projects. And I mean, there's some meme coins in there as well. You know, I. You have to now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to be on those meme coins. I, I'd hold quite a few meme coins. Not a whole lot of money. You've probably got, you know, maybe five, six grand across a, hand, a handful of meme coins. Nothing major. Mm. The the sort of the bigger the coin, you know, I'll have maybe 10, 15K in one, in one single project. Um, but yeah, that's my kind of... How do you kind of see the crypto cycle? First of all, do you subscribe to the cycle theory? Because it's... Playing out pretty well. I mean, from the 2021 top to the recent bottom was about 364 days. From the 2017 top to the 2018 bottom was about 364 days. So everyone's like, oh, it's just going to play out exactly the same, you know? Yeah, look, I, I think I think the cycle has less to do with the markets, more to do with people. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, I, mm. think, I think there is an element of that. But we can't forget the Bitcoin halving, you know, because that has been an indicator of the bull market pretty much every year, yeah. um, every every cycle rather. I think that's what kicks it off because I think Bitcoin's big enough that people know about it. Bitcoin having happens, Bitcoin has a bull run. People start to get interested in crypto again or you know, for the first time and start pouring money into uh, crypto. Once they're in a little bit of Bitcoin, they start seeing all these other things, they start investigating online and before you know it, the whole thing, the whole thing just blows up. So. I think the having event, I think there is an element of that self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing playing out. Um, but ultimately, it's just it's just people, you know. They, people have short-term memory. They get burned, and then a few years later, they've forgotten about it, and Bitcoin hits 50K, and they're like, oh, I was in that before, and, you know, they jump back in, yeah. and there we go. Um, but the other thing that you have is the, the adoption and that kind of thing with, with Bitcoin and with crypto on the large scale. It's only a matter of time before it pops off again, yeah. I, I do believe. Are we going to see a massive you know bull run this time? There's an argument for that with adoption, with regulatory clarity and stuff like that that we're starting to see around you know Ripple and that kind of thing. There is definitely an argument for that. However, just the same way it has every other time, I think if we do an extension of the Bitcoin all-time high, it's going to be less in percentage than it was the previous year and the previous year, just like we see. Do you want to give a figure? Not I think, financial advice. Uh, yeah, not financial. <laughs> don't sue me. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if in the next five years we see 150k Bitcoin. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Similar. I've got 150 to 180 is kind of like my next target for the next one. And but bro, I was in the 100k camp in the last cycle, so oh no, yeah, I don't <laughs> talk about it. See, to be fair, BTC versus UST did hit 100k because well, UST collapsed. Yeah, it hit more than 100k. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you were right. <laughs> um, 
No, but look, I... It was against I, Turkish lira, not USD. Yeah, I, mean, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, you know, it's impossible to, to make these calls, yeah. but I do think you're going to see a six-figure Bitcoin. Mm. I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't. Um, Just on that quickly, do you think that would be more dollar weakness or more just Bitcoin actually just gaining adoption and more liquidity flowing into it? Dollar weakness, you know, sure. But, I mean, it depends on it depends on how the 2024 elections go in the US. Um, the, the dollar tends to do well under a Republican. Um, so well, we, we just have to see effectively. But I think it would be more crypto strength than, than dollar weakness, if, mm-hmm. you know, for the next bull run. And I think that'll be the determining factor. Like the, again, I don't want to go down that sort of cliche route, people compare it to the adoption of the internet and stuff like that, but we are following a similar trajectory to the adoption of, of the internet. You know, the more and more people that get comfortable with it and adopt it, the more the more it goes up effectively. Yeah. You know what I mean? What about if? What's the level that, again, not financial advice, but what's the level where you're like, okay, I need to sell it all here? between 10 and 15K. Mm. I think that's a conservative estimate as well. Um, I really do, I would not be surprised with ETH above 20K. Um, I don't think that's, a, that's not a near term target for me. That's, you know, we're probably talking, you know, within 10 years. Yeah. Um, but I think a 2X, it's all time high, two to three X all time high, I think it could do easily. Yeah. I think ETH is, undervalued the only thing about ETH is it's very slow to transact in it's very expensive to transact in Ripple on the other hand wow I mean I took withdrawals from brokers before I was even into crypto in Ripple broker a broker overseas um, in Cyprus or something like that you take a a bank transfer and you've got it five days later you take it via Ripple and Two days later, uh, two seconds later, rather, it's, it's there. Two days, <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin now. Yeah. Um, no, two seconds later, it's it's in your crypto wallet. Yeah. I mean, Ripple is... Super quick. People are sleeping on Ripple. Yeah. I got into crypto in 2017, and I used to send Bitcoin to the exchanges. Like, I don't know if you've heard of Cryptopia or Bittrex, like the old yeah. school exchanges. Yeah. Um, and it used to take, like, three hours to get there. Yeah. And I realised, actually, if I send Ripple, it'll be there in a few yeah. minutes. Just sell it on the exchange yeah. and buy what you want. Yeah, I mean, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2015 or 2016 to buy a fake ID, believe it or not. Bitcoin was sent at $400. Um, I only know this in hindsight now. But I wanted to buy a fake ID off of this Chinese website because I was, you know, a little rebel. Yeah, I was a degenerate, that's what I was. And to, to basically to buy this fake ID, it was a really good fake ID, they would only accept Bitcoin. So they gave you a tutorial on how to buy the Bitcoin on some website. You had to post a picture you holding a piece of paper with your username on it yeah. and your ID and all that kind of stuff. It was super, super sketchy. But um, there's probably like 1,500 people in China somewhere with my ID. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I spent 80 pounds on this Bitcoin. And at the top of the bull run, it would have been worth 15K. Not bad. You know, 80, 80 pounds to 15K yeah. if I hadn't got that fake ID. Um, was the fake ID worth it? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was for me at the time. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I hadn't done it, but um, at the time, you know, yeah. you were younger. You wanted to go to club and yeah. you know, you wanted to go to raves and that kind of thing. That's what I done. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming, Brian. You come a, a long way. We've been going for just under two hours, so I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Nice. Thank you.